All right, it's finally time to talk in a little bit more detail about my bike, the uh, Minnesoger, or at least I'm calling it that. It's a uh, powerful two-wheel drive electric bike based on the framed Minnesota 2.0 frame. So I call it the Minnesoger because it's heavy and strong, or at least I like to think so. We're going to talk about everything, and we're going to kind of go over every part. <clears throat> I'm going to get some close-up, detailed looks at it, and we're going to start from the back here. <clears throat> First, I want to mention the ENC 3000 direct drive hub motor, which I have installed here on the rear of the bike. I got this from AliExpress. The dealer was N Cycle Bike. These guys did a pretty good job for me. They uh, have an excellent product at a reasonable price. Their customer service is mostly awesome. As long as you have patience, there is a language barrier. But if you ask one question a day, then they're very reliable about answering your questions. So you just got to have patience and you got to be have a have clear communication with them. And I, I had a pretty good experience. The only thing I, I would say went wrong with my interaction with N Cycle Bike from AliExpress, ordering the ENC 3000 rear hub motor kit and its controller, was uh, I ordered a single speed, and as you can see, they sent me a <coughs> seven speed. This didn't ruin the build, but it did. Uh, it did cause me a little bit of a headache and. A little bit of trouble because I had planned on having a single speed freewheel, but they sent me a seven speed, so I had to make a little bit of adjustment, but it really wasn't that big of a deal. And we'll maybe get into more detail on that when we go talk about the chain and the chain tensioner. Until then, right here next to the ENC 3000, we have my Shimano hydraulic disc brakes. The rotor and the calipers. I'm sure most of you are, understand the you know look and function of those parts there. I got those from Amazon. Now in the back here I have a 160 millimeter rotor. In the front I have a 180 millimeter rotor, and we'll, we'll we'll revisit that. Now these uh, these worked out pretty well. Unfortunately, uh, my inexperienced with working with bikes I uh, I did bend the rotor just a little bit during installation just a little bit and so it was kind of a, it was a little bit of a pain learning how to get the rotor straight again I, I just put some nitrile gloves on and kind of manually straightened it out to where it, it now it really sits and glides through the caliper really nicely. It isn't like scientifically perfectly straight, but it it also doesn't rub and it doesn't squeak and it still stops just fine. I've got another rotor and I'll eventually replace it, but yeah, make sure you're nice to your rotors, everybody, or else they're a super pain in the ass. The next thing I'd like to talk about here is my, my torque arm. I'll take this off so y'all can see it a little better. My torque arm, I got this from ebikes.ca. It's a Grin Technologies torque arm. It's a great little piece of hardware for converting pedal bikes to electric. This torque arm specifically in the instructions is actually designed to be mounted to this. Uh, this damn ass rod here, this, this portion of the frame. But it didn't really, with like the, the caliper sitting here and stuff, like it didn't really sit nicely there. Like it reaches and you can set it, but it just, it's really fucking crowded. So I just brought it down here and I used, now it only comes with two hose clamps. It's got three holes in here, but it only comes with two hose clamps. Seems pretty silly to me. Uh, I got an extra hose clamp and... I just went triple hose clamp and I just really, really, really 
cranked those dudes down, dude. Just cranked them way, way down. And now it's like this welded on there. I gotta say, man, I, I definitely would not go with less than three of these hose clamps on here. I have no idea why they only ship with two. Seems pretty silly to me. But with all three hose clamps, it seems like it's working great. My, uh, even with regenerative braking enabled on my ENC 3000, and the torque that this motor is capable of at 52 volts, uh, 50 amps at the battery with 60 amps at the controller. Uh, yeah, even with all that going on, my axle nuts, they never loosen. I check them like every other time I ride and they are always tight AF. They're like never loosened up. The NC8 3000 also came with these little rubber ends, which is pretty nice. I like that. Oh, another thing I think is really important to mention about the ENC 3000, the rear hub. This, uh, the power cable for it here, instead of coming out the end of the axle, it comes out via, uh, uh, a recess here, you know, kind of in the axle slash in the motor. It's, uh, I imagine there's like a, a contact in there and it's got a contact inside the motor too. So instead of running the cable out, they kind of just jump the power outside the motor that way. So you don't have the cable coming out the end of your axle. So it's much easier to work on your axle hardware. And I believe it's also a, a stronger axle design. And we'll talk about that more because my front motor is not that way. On my front motor, the power cable, unfortunately, it does come straight out the end of the axle and will cover some problems that that caused for me. <sighs> Let's see. Let's talk about these tires here. So these tires I got from Amazon. I'm not going to tell you the brand because they're too shitty and I don't want to promote the brand. They were cheap and they, fun they function. The tires certainly work. And there is some advantages to them, but straight up front, I'm going to tell you these, these tires are not really that circular, so they wobble. And uh, they're, the grip from the compound of the rubber, it, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel that good. Like it feels like maybe a higher quality rubber would give me higher performance, but the one advantage to these tires, one thing I really like about them is this tread pattern here for the summer, being that I use this bike to commute. You can see that the tread pattern, it's, uh, it's very smooth. It's good for rolling efficiently over flat terrain. The central strip here, it can almost be like riding on a slick, especially with the way these studs here are kind of angled. It's decent for like uh, water and other things. And it, and it kind of gives you this road tire, street tire feel on the street, but it doesn't leave you feeling like you have slicks on when you're in like wet grass or trails or dirt or grass. It still feels like the fat bike tire is grabbing the earth for you. And I do appreciate that. But yeah, like I said, straight up front, I'm not going to tell you the brand on these. They're pretty easy to find. They're cheap on Amazon. Uh, the rubber and the shape of them is just too shitty. Don't get them. I have, but I do have V tire, uh, tubes inside there. I do have the V tire brand tubes inside the tire, which I also got from Amazon. and Those seem to be fine. Uh, I have these fenders. We'll talk about all three fenders right now since we're running into this one here. These are from uh, PDW, Portland, Portland Delta Works, Pacific, Pacific Delta Works. I apologize. I don't remember exactly the name of the brand, but again, I got these on Amazon. Uh, they're the mud shovel 
set of snap-on fenders. It's pretty simple. These are great. I'm totally impressed by them. They are, uh, you know, they're kind of flimsy compared to like a motorcycle fender. But I think that they're great because they, they effectively do their job blocking mud and water from the rear tire, traveling up at the rider and spraying all over the place. They also look pretty good and they're very durable despite the fact that they're kind of, uh, yeah, like I said, it's kind of, it's not like steel or metal or anything like that, but it snaps on with these buttons here. So this will snap on and snap off just like your pants. And I have accidentally kicked this off before, just kicking my foot over the bike and I've kicked it right off before and it snaps right back on. No problem. <clears throat> Uh, it's got this, uh, belt, kind of, kind of belt, uh, cinched quick release. Now I'm kind of a meathead. So I like really tighten shit down on this bike because I, I don't want anything to not be tight enough. And as you can see there, it's kind of blurry. There you go. It's clearing up. I broke the buckle a little bit because I was just wrenching on it way too hard. You don't have to wrench on it that hard. This material here grabs the seat post pretty good, so it sticks pretty nicely. Uh, or else you might crack the buckle, like I did. But even with the buckle cracked, it still grabs on, holds on just fine. I have the Milan rear light with laser ground effects. Uh, it's light sensing, so I don't know if inside the lit apartment here, if it's going to give us the light or not. Okay, so it thinks it's dim enough in here to stay on. But one thing I don't like about this light, while it's pretty cool for the most part, uh, it's light sensing. So if it's sunny out and you want to have your rear light on, it's, it's not going to turn on. You're going to try to turn it on. It's going to boot up and it's going to turn directly off. It's going to be like, it's too bright out. You don't need it on. It's kind of like battery saving. And so like if you're on, I don't know, some kind of long ride, I guess it could just automatically turn on once it gets dim enough, which is cool ish, but it would be really nice if you could turn off the light sensing. What I plan to do is try to find out where the light sensor is on it. And I'm just going to block it with some tape and see if I can't just get it to turn on whenever I tell it to. Uh, again, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get a great look at it, but there are laser ground effects from the rear light, which is kind of like a guide for like uh, other vehicles and pedestrians to understand like a recommended safe distance from your bike. Here on the wall, it looks like you can see it pretty good, but that's a laser line which is being projected from my rear light here. And you can imagine, there, you can imagine how that looks on the street, especially at night. Pretty cool, but also, you know, just another step safer, giving people like uh, an active visual line to kind of show like, this is my area. This is where I'm riding. And now outside this line here, outside that line here, uh, that can be where you are, but I'm over here. You dig? I thought that was pretty sweet. All right, so let's talk about the seat. The seat and the frame and the handlebars and the, let's see, what else? Oh, and the pedals. I got all of them from thehouse.com. So again, that's the seat, the frame, the pedals, the handlebars, and whatever else I just said. I got that from thehouse.com. Uh, they have pretty great prices on these products, especially if you buy the components individually like I did for this build. In case you didn't know, uh, this is not a conversion build necessarily. This bike was built from components. So the only time that this bike was ever a strictly pedal bike was for like the two day period where I had assembled it enough to be a pedal bike, but I had not yet 
you know, I installed the battery and the controllers and whatnot. It, it, this has always been intended to be an electric bike, and it was built from individual components. Anyway, the seat. The seat is a framed bronze series seat, I believe they call it. Uh, it's great. feels great. To be honest, it's been a long time since I'd ridden a bike, though I was an avid bicycle rider when I was a teenager. It had just been quite a long time since it had been part of my life, and I was kind of wondering if a seat this narrow was going to be very comfortable if I wanted something a little more significant, but it turns out this seat is awesome. I love it. It's not uncomfortable at all. Uh, I've never been saddle sore from this seat, though the longest rides I've probably been on have been like an hour and a half, so, you know, that's not like a lot of riding. It's like... It's like some riding, but it's not like a ton. Uh, I will, one, one kind of modification to that story. I will say that before I finished the Minnesota, I was spending a lot of time on an exercise bike at the gym so I could get used to being on the saddle and also get my, you know, cardiovascular fitness up a little bit before I begin committing to riding a bike most days of the week, often multiple times a day for commuting for certain purposes, whatever purpose. So like I said, I got the, the seat from the house. It's the Brown series. It's great. It's comfy. Works fine. I ride the seat pretty low. Uh, it's slammed pretty much as low as my rear light and my fender will allow. Uh, that's mostly because I do ride this with mostly using the throttle. Uh, when I, and when I pedal, I'm usually standing up. I'm one of those guys who likes to pedal standing up. Uh, I, I also pedal sitting down like a little, but I really like when it, when it's time to pedal, I really like just, just getting after and pushing real hard. So, uh, I don't, I don't really see a reason to have my seat at like a height where it would be a better pedaling technique for me while seated. Instead, the advantage of having this seat this low is my center of balance is lower, which means that the entire bike's center of balance, the entire system, which includes me as a rider, center of balance becomes lower, which makes both my handling and my stability under acceleration better. So if you're going to be making a powerful e-bike, a powerful fat bike, then maybe reconsider the advantages and disadvantages of having your seat in an appropriate pedaling position or maybe just slammed so you can have that lower center of gravity for better handling in corners. <sighs> okay, so I got these bags here. These bags, it's... Good for some storage, and I've got it secured with a loose-ish zip tie here. And then in the back, it's just got a Velcro strap. I got these from the Freewheeler Bike Shop, which is this place in Grand Rapids here. Grand Rapids, Michigan. They are traditionally, you know, an acoustic bike shop, but they are certainly electric bike friendly. They, they're selling electric bikes, and they are servicing electric bike parts. I don't know if I've ever seen them servicing electric bikes, but I have seen them work on my parts, which we'll get to. <sighs> anyway, yeah, I got these this bag from the Freewheeler. And basically what this bag does is it covers up this mess of wires here. That's its primary function, just to sit on top of that mess of wires and so it doesn't look like there's just a, a nest of wires there, but there actually is. It's also decent for storing some things. Like sometimes I'll put gloves in here or like my keys or something. More importantly is this bag. And this bag I got from Amazon. It's the large Ibera triangle bag, which I'm sure you can easily find on Amazon. This houses my 52 volt, uh, 150 amp, 24 amp hour high C 
battery, which is the power source for the entire system. As you can see, the battery is terminated with a spark resistant XT90 plug. And then it's also terminated with this charging cable, which connects to the charger. And I just, I like to store the charging cable right in there, right in that pocket there behind these zip ties. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's enough. I'll get back to that later. All right. So let's talk about the bag and then we'll talk about the battery and then we'll talk about power distribution. Okay. So first of all, the bag was not big enough to house the battery. And as you can see, the bag barely even looks like a triangle anymore. You can see the one corner of the triangle is all smashed up there, and then that's all kind of smashed in there, too. Basically, what I did was, well, it's not even basically, but it's exactly what I did. Exactly what I did was, I opened the bag all the way in the largest pocket here, which is where the, where the battery entered the bag. And I just shove the battery into the bag with the, with the zipper all the way open. Now, obviously it looked like 10 pounds of shit in a five pound sack because it was. But in order to solve that issue, I just left the zipper all the way open with the battery inside the bag. And then I found where the most tension was in the bag on the opposite side, which was this corner of the battery. This corner of the battery was causing the most tension in the bag. So what I did was I took my X-Acto knife and a blade and I started making a cut kind of equidistant from this corner here in both directions until I had made a hole large enough on this side of the bag that I had enough room to zip the zipper closed. And then once I had the zipper closed around the battery, which is inside the bag, I began to form a patch inside the, or inside the bag. Yeah. So I have this gorilla tape here. It, it's, it's not gorilla brand tape. This is like Iron Force or Iron Forge or something tape. I got it at uh, the Home Depot. Uh, I just asked a guy for some really strong tape, and this is what he handed to me, and it worked just fine. So what I did was, with the sticky side facing out of the bag, I began to line the interior of the bag with this tape. Okay, so the battery is inside the bag, and I'm like lining the inside of the bag with the sticky side of the tape facing out. And then once I had that whole patch made from basically tape mail, just, you know, layers of overlapping tape facing out, I did the same thing facing in. And then I kind of waved the bag around because obviously the bag wasn't installed on the bike yet when I was doing all this. And it held up just fine. So, like, the bag is totally strong enough to contain the battery, even without being supported by these zip ties here. Four sets of zip ties. One, two, three, four. Uh, so, uh, how does the bag exactly mount to the frame? It has a Velcro strap here. It's got one there. And two more there. And also, I have run these zip ties over top of or in combination with the Velcro straps. This black one here is a little harder to see, but it goes behind these wires here. And over top the frame, uh, the four sets of zip ties has proven uh, plenty strong to suspend the battery. However, I have run into a single occasion where one set of zip ties did bust off, leaving me with three sets on. 
However, I carry a plethora of zip ties in my backpack all the time, so I just put another set on, and since then it's been fine. What I think happened exactly was that set was just way tighter than every other set of zip ties, and so it just busted off. But now I've got all four of these sets at pretty equivalent tension and also kind of pulling a little bit in different directions. So the, uh, the battery is pretty evenly suspended. As well as the, the Velcro straps are definitely contributing to the mounting of the battery as well. If it wasn't for those Velcro straps, I'd probably just put like, I don't know, four more sets of zip ties on it. Maybe some going like this way. <sighs> Let's see. So the battery's t terminated with this XC90 cable. Uh, and I made this paralleling harness, which kind of goes underneath this bag here. And it connects to the controller here to provide power to the controller, which provides power to the front motor. And then on the other side, we have the same kind of controller. So these are 60 amp, 48 volt to 72 volt controllers, which came from N-Cycle Bike, AliExpress. I got a lot of parts from them. They did a great job on helping me out, helping me get the right parts for the job. But anyway, I was talking about that paralleling harness. Yeah, you can see, where's that here? You can see, yeah, it comes over here and powers the other one. So I have a single battery powering both of my controller via a single, basically splitter. So right here, you can see what I did was I made a three-way soldered union. So this was a single set of positive and negative 10 gauge wire, which was kind of traveling this direction here. And then I took another set and I, I cut the cut the silicon off here. And I took another set and I stripped the end of it and I did the, the NASA style kind of three, three winds each direction solder fusion. So you can see I've got two sets of fusions there, one positive and one negative. So that's how I paralleled the power from the battery to the controllers. Okay, so it's a perfect time to talk about the controllers. These controllers also came from N-Cycle Bike. Yes, both of them came from N-Cycle Bike. Uh, what I did to gather all the components for this build was I ordered the rear, the ENC3000 rear hub kit, the whole conversion kit from N-Cycle Bike on AliExpress. And I asked them to send me an extra controller and an extra SW900 display. And yeah, they hooked me up and it, you know, I paid them for it, but, but yeah, they did it. So when I purchased the front motor, which is an easy 350, which I did not get from AliExpress, I got it from ebikes.ca from Grintech. I was able to just use the 60 amp controller to power it instead of the, typically those motors are powered by 25 amp controllers, or at least that's what it seems like when you look at the internet up for them. Anyway, these controllers, they're, they're great. They came with regenerative braking enabled automatically. They came with a 50 amp battery draw limit. That does not mean that the controller is only providing 50 amps to the motors. The controllers are 60 amp controllers, but they only draw a maximum of 50 amps from the battery, or at least that's what is displayed on my SW900 display. Of course, I've never gotten in there and checked with the, uh, the current meter to see if that's an actual fact, but I imagine that's the truth. 50 amps, up to 50 amps can go in the controller and then it spits out 60 amps. I mean, depending on 
your riding conditions. You know, it's not always doing 60 amps. But, like, I mean, you get it, right? Anyway, they work great. Hooking up the regenerative braking and everything was as easy as just making sure that the brakes were hooked up. You can see, because I have two controllers, each controller is prepared to receive brake input from two different brakes, the front and the rear, because the controller is designed to support, one controller is designed to support one bike. But on each of them, I only have one of the brake cables connected. So like the front controller, the controller on the left side, which controls the front motor, only has one of its brake connections connected, which is this purple connection here. Now, I, I imagine I will clean up these wires. I'll wrap them all up in electric tape like a lot of this stuff is. But I wanted some of this stuff to be exposed to show you guys for this video. So I've left them uncovered and I've just been riding with them exposed. It's been no big deal. Obviously, I left the speed limiter, which is these blue ones here. I left this unconnected. There's no reason to connect that. Let's be real. I think this is for a key. I'm pretty sure this is for a key switch, which I don't have. And then, to be completely honest, I kind of forget what this one's supposed to be. But it's not important. It definitely doesn't need to be connected for the bike to operate. So it isn't. Talk <sighs> about how I mounted the controllers to sit symmetrically on the front here. So basically what I did, we can pull back the bag a little bit, is there's a series of zip ties that I put through the mounting holes on the sides of the controllers and I just wrapped them around each other and the frame in such a way that uh, there we go. I just wrapped them around the each other in the frame in such a way that they're bound. So that means you've got a couple zip ties like going up and down over here. You got a couple going up and down over here. And then they also connect to each other left and right. And then you've got like zip ties like this one here, which are kind of binding it forward so that they stay. No brackets, no uh, trying to mount to like water bottle mounts, just wrapped up in, in zip ties. You can kind of see over here too, there's zip ties. I got one that's cut there, which was in my way and it's, it's not necessary to keep them suspended. You can see deep in there, there's zip ties, more zip ties holding them forward so they don't slide backwards or forward. All right, so, the last thing about the controllers and the EZ350 motor. Obviously, because these controllers were not designed with the EZ350 in mind, the three-phase power and hall sensor connections, which are in the, these clusters of electrical tape here, did not have the same kind of connections on them. So I had to cut the phase wires and splice in some new wires right here, these, these three thick guys right here. And I spliced in some new wires, just some red and black 10 gauge. Uh, and I terminated them in AS150s. You're just gonna have to believe me, there's AS150s inside here. I also cut the ends off the EZ350 connectors because they were not prepared for 60 amps of power. And I put AS150s on that end too, obviously, because you need AS150 on both sides in order to make the connection. And then uh, I used, for the hall sensors, I used, uh, I think it's like three pin or five pin JSTM or something like that, which I got on Amazon. I got all those connectors on Amazon. All right. Let's, yeah, since we're here, let's just talk about the front motor. Okay, we can talk about the EZ350 motor here for a second. Now, 
it does create plenty of torque for the front. Currently, I have 17 amps of battery draw set from my controller. So the controller spits out up to 60 amps, but it only draws 17 amps from the battery. Which means it's limiting kind of the torque range of the power applied to the EZ350 here. Which keeps the EZ350 in its acceptable power range, which is 500 to 1000 watts. Now the EZ350 does a great job, and uh, in the review for the bike, I did explain how it does have like this uh, clutch engagement weirdness. And it also isn't the same KV as a rear motor, and so that causes not, not really a problem, it's just an imperfection for the build. But the one thing I really wish was different about this motor is this wire here. I wish this cable was terminated out the base here, the base of the the spot where the axle exits the motor housing, so that it was easier to work on this hardware here, like the rear motor. But it's not the case, and it stopped me from being able to put two torque arms on the front. I really wanted to run two torque arms on both my motors, but it I still could. It's just going to take quite a bit more work because I have to get around this cable without cutting this again. Uh, which is something I have an idea for, but I simply, I just haven't done it yet and I'm probably not going to do it for a while. But well, isn't that a great motor? Provides plenty of torque. Uh, I know I said in the review that I set it to 13 amps. But it's actually currently sitting at 17 amps and it's still working great. Alright, we had a little bit of an interruption there, guys, because my phone was giving me like this weird error and I don't, I don't want to deal with any weird errors. I just want it to work. So, so, so we're back. Anyway, the EZ350 is a geared hub motor, which means that it freewheels. It freewheels when powered, uh, when, when driven, but unpowered. So you can be pedaling and the bike is traveling forward, but the front motor is not powered. So the clutch is not engaged. So the internals freewheel, which means you do not have to spin the weight of those internals when the motor is driven by from a source other than electric power, unlike the ENC3000. The specific advantage of that, especially in this configuration, is that when you are accelerating or cornering on this bike, you are mostly using the rear motor here, and... In order to keep the temperature on the rear motor down, as well as improve accelerating and cornering performance, we can choose to leave the front unpowered and also make sure that it does not provide a ton of extra resistance for our rear motor to push when we want to use single rear wheel thrust. I guess the, the shortest way to explain that is uh, basically two-wheel drive bikes, or this two-wheel drive bike, when you're in a corner and you want to use both wheels because you think, like, the front's going to pull me around while the back pushes me around. So I'm going to, I'm going to corner better. I'm just going to have better grip. It's, dude's. It, that might be true at really slow speeds, like crawling speeds. But any speed where you're like leaning to turn because you have centrifugal forces or centripetal forces, whatever, pulling you to the outside. If you then engage the front motor with power, the front wheel will want to slide out 
to the outside of the corner or push. You'll feel your center, center of balance push to the outside of the corner. And I'm here to tell you it's not a cool feeling. So the idea of a two wheel drive bike in a corner when you just, if you imagine approaching a corner, is that you're going to break to slow down for the corner on the outside. And then as you drift inside the corner toward the inside in order to hit the apex, you're going to grab acceleration on the rear wheel the same time you normally would on any other sort of motorbike. But then, once you are out of the corner and stabilized and going in a generally straight direction, you engage the front motor and you get that two-wheel drive acceleration. And it feels real good and cool. But I'm here to tell you, it, it is simply not the case that if you try to use both the front and rear wheel at the same time while in a corner or exiting an apex of a corner, you are not going, you are at best going to have diminished cornering performance and at worst, your front wheel is going to come right out from underneath you because it definitely feels like it can if you screw around with that too much. Anyway, <sighs> let's talk about my, let's just mention my headset real quick. So I tried to install my own headset when this project was in its earliest age and it, it just didn't work out for me. <laughs> I got the headset press and everything. But when I tried to put it all together, it just, it literally just fell apart afterwards. So I'm lucky that I didn't break, bust anything or mark anything up from the high pressure of the headset press or that nothing got stuck in there where I like something had to be banged up or bent to get it out. It just fell apart, which is, I guess, lucky for me. Anyway, again, I took this, I took the frame, the headset, and uh, my crank set to Freewheeler, that joint here in Grand Rapids, which I mentioned earlier in the video, and asked him, like, hey, man, I tried to put this headset in, and I couldn't figure it out. I don't know what's going on. And they're like, hey, you got the wrong headset. Well, I was like, well, it's already here, so I let Freewheeler install my headset for me. Now, it says originate here on top, but I don't know if that's completely true because I think the internals, I think it's like they did something weird where they used like half of my old headset, but on the inside they used like half of a different headset. But wh whatever, it, it works great. Uh, Freewheeler did a great job setting it up exactly like I asked them to. They even put the spacers on for me, 20 millimeters of height for my handlebars there. The bottom bracket and crank set. Uh, Freewheeler put these on for me too. I don't have the bottom bracket tool. And the crank set, which I bought from Amazon, uh, it didn't fit the frame. So it was like a road bike crank. And I didn't understand that there was such a distinction. I thought the crank set was just kind of or at least the, the crank set that I bought, I thought was just kind of, you know, one size fits Al sort of deal. But turns out that's totally not the case. And Freewheeler put a crank set on for me with 44 teeth. And, uh, this, the, the Holes Feller AL7050 TV crank arms. And it works freaking great. Uh, I guess we could talk about the frame, since we're sitting down here already. Uh, the framed Minnesota 2.0 is an aluminum fat bike frame, which has overbuilt, uh, or at least it's advertised as having overbuilt uh, frame strength. So supposedly this frame is built to withstand the energy of jumping 
and I assume perhaps crashing. And so therefore it is a, it is highly suitable for the purposes of conversion to electric because of the integrity of the frame. The dropouts are thick. They're aluminum, but they're thick. And of course the rear where most of my torque is made in the ENC 3000 is braced by two of those Grintec torque arms. So I showed you that one earlier, but there's another one on the other side too. So yeah, it's, it's in there, man. And like I said earlier, my, my axle nuts stay tight. Speaking of axle and the frame though, the ENC 3000's axle is large compared to other e-bike motors and it does not fit in the, I guess the, the, the receiving part of the dropouts. It is the proper width. The ENC 3000 and cycle bike did make sure that the ENC 3000 motor and axle were prepared for the width of this bike's dropouts, which is 170 millimeters, but the axle was just too thick. So I did end up having to file both the Grintec torque arm to be larger and the dropouts to be a little bit larger. It was pretty labor intensive, but totally worked fine. Works super okay. Oh, uh, let's see what's next. I guess we can get up to the handlebars and the handlebar furniture here. Uh, we'll just go from left to right. All the way here on the end, I have an IPSXP headlight. This is a thousand lumen headlight with a high, low strobe. I have one on each side. Uh, Maybe if I was to buy again, and yeah, I got these from Amazon, but maybe if I was to buy again, I would get a different headlight because I saw another headlight on there I really liked that was just a little more expensive. That's like 2,000 lumens and 4,000 lumens would have been pretty sweet, but whatever. These were 19 bucks a piece and uh, they totally do the job. They uh, hook onto the handlebar here, real, real simple. This is, they've got some crap that you put inside the collar here, and then you just tighten it down. And because the crap that comes with it to put inside the collar is rubber, I noticed that riding on bouncy roads, this thumb screw likes to come loose over time because the bounce in rubber just kind of pushes it out real slowly over time. So like maybe every other ride, I just tighten it down real quick. Not a big deal. Uh, instead of grips, I've got handlebar tape. I didn't like the idea of having to take grips on and off here, especially if I wanted to rearrange my other handlebar hardware. So I just use grip tape and I secure the grip tape with a little bit of electrical tape. It's a little bit haggard here at the end because when I was making the uh, cruising on the Minnesota video, I had my phone with this this caw clamp here just on the end of this handlebar here and it kind of squished the crap out of the handlebar tape and tore it up. So it looks kind of a little bit crappier than it did at one time, but whatever, it still works great. Oh, uh, we have my rear lights control right here. You can the lasers, the emergency, and your blinkers here, left and right blinkers, which is pretty cool, but it would be really cool if it worked during the day. Anyway, they had the SW900 display and the throttle for the front motor. Uh, I mean, there's not really much to say about these. They work, you know, as intended. I guess, uh, I guess one thing I should mention is this one on the left here for the front motor. It does not display watts correctly and it does not display speed correctly, and neither of them really display power correctly. Now, the reason it doesn't display watts or speed really correctly is because the controller was set up to support a motor, a direct drive hub motor like the ENC 3000. 
because I didn't tell N-Cycle Bike that I was going to be supporting the EZ350 with their controller, or I didn't even tell them that I was going to be supporting it with a geared hub motor. But I imagine that if I had made this communication with them, or if I had the tools to interface with the firmware inside the controller here, uh, then it would probably be possible to make the speed and wattage display correctly on this display. But as it is, it doesn't. Now the power for both of them doesn't display correctly because this is a 52 volt battery, which I believe is 14S. I'm pretty sure 52 volts means 14S. But the SW900 displays can only be set to 48 volts, 60 volts, or 72 volts. So, because I have 52 volts in the system, but the SW900 displays set the controllers for 48 volts, this means that the voltimeter inside the controller is expecting 48 volt type values in order to estimate how much of our battery we've discharged. But because I have four more volts, 4.2 more volts, the battery has to be significantly drained for me to even display a single loss, a single cell of battery power lost on the display. Now I haven't done the math, the conversion to see like what one bar of power loss here kind of equates to on my 52 volt battery. But I'll say that when I see one bar from the voltimeter here go away, I go home. <laughs> that's, that's my signal to go home and charge or get to where I can charge because I don't want to screw around with over discharging my battery. Anyway, uh, I have double thumb throttles here. I do not have a pedal assist system installed on the bike, so there's no pedal assist. Uh, what is that? No pedal assist detector between my pedals. Though the controllers are ready to accept that functionality, I simply did not install it. Because I had Freewheeler, the bike shop, I had him put my crank set in, and I did not want to go through the hassle of disassembling the crank set in order to put the PAS on. And to be completely honest, I don't, I don't miss it even a little. This is my first e-bike, so I've never had pedal assist. But like, it isn't that hard to learn how to use the throttle and pedal if you want to. And because I do have the, bike locked into a single speed, which we'll talk about more soon. It's actually not that hard to pedal. You can't go real fast on just the pedals. You'll run out of pedal at about 15 miles per hour, but like really it's not a big deal to pedal this bike. It, it is not unpowered. It's not a big deal to pedal it. So I went with these thumb throttles because basically when I had the throttle on, I didn't want to be pedaling and pumping the throttle. And with like, if I had a twist, so the kit for the ENC 3000, it typically comes with a twist throttle, but I specifically ordered these thumb throttles because it just really didn't seem like a good idea on a bike that I do plan to pedal with quite a bit. And I do. I really didn't want a twist throttle on there. I just thought it would be safer to have thumb throttle and I love it. Works great. Got your hydraulic brakes here. Now we have a little bit of ingenuity from my girlfriend that we can talk about. So to get the regenerative braking working properly on your controllers from N-Cycle Bike, the hydraulic brake sensor, yeah, that's what the other part is, pedal assist sensor. Anyways, the hydraulic brake sensor has to be exposed to this magnet here. You see the little silver magnet on the right, which is 
bound by a rubber band. And on the left, you see my hydraulic brake sensor, which is bound with electrical tape. Now, for the controller to understand that the hydraulic brake has been engaged, this hydraulic brake sensor here on the left detects that the magnet moves away. Even that little bit of distance is plenty to trigger the brake detection for the controllers. Now, once the controllers detect a brake, they immediately, both of them, front and rear, both of them go into regenerative braking mode. Now, I don't really get any use out of that on my front because it is a, it is a geared hub motor, which means it freewheels, which means it cannot perform regenerative braking. However, I do still have it enabled on the front and what it does do is it nearly immediately stops the front motor from spinning instead of freewheeling inside the motor while slowing down. Uh, that probably really makes negligible difference for anything, but whatever, both sides are the same, and I like that. So let's talk about this rubber band here. This is the genius of my girlfriend. Let's see if we can get a good picture on that. So basically... I was looking at videos on the internet, on Google, on YouTube, trying to figure out the best way to mount this hydraulic brake sensor and my magnet here. And, you know, there's like dudes who use glue and like these different steps. And it does, it is a nice mounting job. They do look good. But unfortunately, my hydraulic brakes here, they're not the same shape as some of those videos. And I didn't have like the high power glue and or the patience or the time. So all I did was I took a thin little rubber band. This again, this is my girlfriend's idea. And I shoved it. I, sh I shoved it through. This is like a, a toroid. So it has a hole in the center. I shoved it through the hole and then I just bound it around the brake candle here a few times and pushed it towards the edge of the brake handle so it's close enough there. Now you might say like, well Jay, that's kind of a janky way to hang up your brake sensors. And you're probably right. Uh, I admit, while riding, I have had the magnets displaced slightly, which turns the, hydro which turns the regenerative braking on all the time. And of course, it's not good for the bike to be like just being pedaled or having the throttle applied to one wheel, but the regenerative braking applied to another. It's really stupid to do that. So you do just have to stay aware and be doing brake checks at your lights and stuff and just make sure that you're, they're sitting right. Now, it's not totally unreliable and janky. It's, it's only happened to me once. Basically, for the magnet to just sit, one, it's a magnet, so it's sticking to the handlebar or the brake handle because the brake handle is metal. It's magnetic metal. But also, the rubber band, I have tied it in a kind of specific way so that underneath the magnet here, most of the material rubber band is kind of behind it. So the magnet kind of tips toward the brake sensor here. And it holds in place kind of nicely. Doesn't really move too much. Yeah, it kind of, it just sits there pretty good. And if you break a rubber band, it's not that, it's not even that big of a deal because the rubber band's all bound up. It usually just continues to stick. As well as, I mean, these are magnets. They're not going anywhere. They're stuck to the metal here. All right. So let's just talk about my wire organization kind of mess here, right? There's just so much distance of electrical and hydraulic wires to round up on this project. And I definitely didn't want to like cut them and resolder them to make them shorter or anything. But basically behind my SW900 displays, the power for the things like the throttle 
and the displays have been wrapped several times around the handlebars behind them. And then wrapped around the hydraulic brake cable here. I'm telling you, man, these were just so long. Like, they're expecting the display, the controller, and the motor to be on, like, two different bikes or something. <sighs> All right, so we talk a little bit about my car car here. I got this from Amazon. There's better phone mounting accessories. This one's pretty good. You grab the corners of your phone with these rubber ears here and these spring-loaded brackets. And yeah, it'll grab the crap out of your phone. And it doesn't matter how big your phone is either. I have this huge case on my phone and it still grabs it just fine. All right, let's talk about the other side just a little bit. We're almost done here, guys. Oh, I'm just going to hold on to the handlebar here and kind of lean it over so we can look at this side here. And just talk about the chain for a short time and the freewheel on the rear side. Okay, mm, pretty toes. So like I said, I expected to have a single speed, and the bike was always intended to be a single speed at the pedal, and I never wanted a mid-drive. I definitely knew that I wanted a, a uh, hub motor in both the rear and front. <sighs> so at first, when I got the seven speed, I was kind of dismayed. I was like, oh no, is it going to line up right? Am I going to have to put shifters on my bike? Uh. But nope. Turns out that... Right where the derailleur is going to mount, I just mounted this chain tensioner, which again I got from Freewheeler. It's a, what is that, Shimano? What does that say? Yeah, yeah, it says Shimano. Alfina. Alfine. Alfine. Chain tensioner. And then, uh, I forget the brand of this chain. I, I forget the brand of the chain off the top of my head, but it is an awesome chain. The... The link, there it is right there. This master link here that they've got for this brand of chain. Oh, this is such a pain. Ugh. Ugh. Right there. There we go. Ugh, focus up. You can do it. Camera. There we go. SRAM. That's it. The master link for this chain is awesome. So easy to uninstall and reinstall. Way better than KMC, by the way. Ugh. Oh, I gotta bend the mic up. Yeah. Oh, it is heavy. Woo. I was leaning it way over there. Oh, anyway. Well, let's get back over here. Anyway, like I said, I got that chain from Freewheeler. And all I did was I put the chain tensioner on where the derailleur goes. It lined up perfectly with the third gear there. I just laid the chain on top of the third gear and ran it over my crank set. And it works great, dudes. It's, it's a single speed. There's no shifters, none of that, none of hanging that shit up. It's just like a seven speed freewheel that's been put in single speed by my chain tensioner. And I gotta tell you guys, I love it. I love it. Whew. Damn, I was leaning that bike way too far over. It was that was kind of a a uh, uncomfortable position to be in for a second. My brow is all sweaty. Let's see. I guess that's I guess that's it, guys. Yeah, moral of the story. I guess what I want to leave y'all with is uh, don't be afraid. To purchase components from AliExpress, specifically the dealer and cycle bike. And make sure that you brace your motors with Grin Tech Torque Arms. Oh yeah, that reminds me. The last thing. I got a Grin Tech Torque Arm over here too. Which I didn't didn't mention before. But yeah, I got the front end torque arm, and then of course I got the two on the back.
yeah, so like I was saying, don't be afraid to buy from AliExpress, specifically the dealer and cycle bike. Don't be afraid to build your e-bike, your electric bike, electric motorcycle, electric vehicle. Don't be afraid to do it from components. It doesn't have to be a conversion. Uh, it was hard. It took some labor and a lot of research because I did not know how to do it to start to get this together. But it was definitely affordable. And it's continuing to save me money now. And it's, I mean, look at it. It's beautiful. And it's, it's just a whole, it's a whole barrel of fun, guys. I gotta say. I hope you enjoyed learning these details about the build. Thanks for watching.